Great. Um, yeah, um, my name is Alvi. I'm a PhD student in the Roth Lab, and I'm going to be talking about engineering and profiling of complex ABC transporter knockout combinations in yeast. So in a yeast cell, if you want to make a knockout, it's very straightforward. All you have to do is design the proper homologous combination cassette, integrate into the genome. Because it's so easy, people have done it for um, about all the 6,000 genes in the yeast genome, but the lessons weren't very exciting. The lessons were that 80% of the genes are not essential and that 68% of them actually give you no phenotype at all in terms of growth under rich medium. So to expand this, people started making these uh, double knockout combinations in which you combine uh, two single knockouts of a gene in a given cell. And this is done using the SGA technology, for example, in Charlie Boone's lab. And what you see with these double knockout profiles are that uh, many genes combine to give you unexpected uh, growth effects. So you can have, for example, uh, two knockouts, each of which do almost nothing to the cell, but when combined in the same cell, they make it either sick or dead. This would be called uh, an example of a negative genetic interaction. Or similarly, you can have two knockouts which make the cell sick, and you'd expect that if they're both combined in the same cell, it would be even sicker. But then if you see that it's just as sick as any single knockout, this would be an example of a positive genetic interaction. And of course, there are uh, many other unexpected multi-knockout phenotypes um, or genetic interactions which are possible. And these are very important because if you make these double knockout profiles, you can use them to cluster genes based on function. Or if you do it on a small scale under multiple conditions, you get these uh, genetic relationships which in many ways reflect what is known about the biology of these genes in the given pathway, in this example, uh, in DNA repair under MS stress in yeast. Uh, but of course, just because we stop at two genes doesn't mean that these can't exist in a more complex manner. So for example, you can have three genes which only give you a sick cell if uh, all three of them are combined in a given cell. Or again, analogously enough, uh, any combination of three genes which give you the same phenotype in any, in any way you make them. Uh, it's estimated, well, probably now proven that the total number of genetic interactions vastly outnumbers that of these two gene interactions which are already known. And, but it's just very difficult to study these because the number of combinations are just vast. And you don't have to stop there. There's a five gene interaction known, seven gene interaction, and I think the record now is a 20 gene interaction in yeast. So what we want to do is we want to create a targeted genetic variation in a population to study these multi-gene effects in depth. So this is our uh, method, which actually is the one part I'll have to skip here, mostly, to engineer this variation at a population level. So our pilot gene system are the ABC transporters. Uh, the yeast cell has 22 ABC transporters that are known, 16 of which are in gene families involved in multi-drug resistance. Uh, any given ABC transporter can export hundreds of structurally unrelated small compounds, so they're important in drug resistance. And using technologies developed in our lab, we've been able to create a, a yeast strain which has uh, 16 of these 22 transporters involved in multi-drug resistance knocked out, which I'll schematize as such. And basically the idea is uh, we take the 16 knockout strain, we cross it to a pool of wild type cells, and just by random segregation, any of the progeny will have a random collection of knockouts among these ABC transporters. And this is the part I'll skip, but uh, basically, using a combination of next generation sequencing strategies and gene engineering, we've been able to create this map which we can take these multiple knockout combinations and profile them for drug sensitivity in uh, many different drugs. So now I'll be talking about, first of all, how we visualize the data in a broad scale, and I'm going to zoom into one trait and show you something cool with that. Uh, so far, we've tested a collection of uh, antifungal and anti-cancer drugs, and in the future, we'll be expanding this to include known substrates of all the transporters. But for now, we're only going to focus on six of these genes. So I've made this representation. So in the middle, I colored it the uh, wild type. This is a cell that is wild type for these six genes, but is otherwise free to vary at the other 10 loci. And then if uh, knockout makes you more sensitive to a given drug, in this case, fentanyl, then it's colored in either red or yellow, if it makes you more resistant, it's colored in blue. So what you see here is that an SNK delete makes you more sensitive to venomil, whereas surprisingly, but already known, uh, PDR5 delete makes you more resistant. And you can expand this analogy to look at 
uh, two knockout combinations. So you can see that a PR5 Euro 1 double knockout is even more resistant, whereas an SNQ2 delete is sensitive no matter what the combination uh, is. We expand this to look at uh, all uh, six gene knockouts within these genes and have pruned you know, any kind of dead ends. And again, you see a lot of uh, combinations which make you more resistant and more sensitive. And amongst two replicates, it looks largely the same. And what's cool about this visualization is that we can uh, zoom out and look at all of our drugs at once. And again, um, what really struck us about this data is that not only do you see many knockout combinations which make you more sensitive, but also more resistant. So I'm going to zoom into one trait which, which we found that was really cool. This is under Proconazole. And what we found is that making any combination of one, two, or three knockouts gives you very little resistance, whereas a four gene deletion makes you highly resistant. But then if you further knock down a fifth gene, you're back to um, where we started from. So, now I'm just going to look at this trait more in depth. So this is just sort of the same uh, visualization. In this case, this is the population. So it's a distribution of all the cells which have these um, six genes present in their fitness. And the first thing that's obvious is that removing PDR5 makes you much more sensitive to fluconazole. If we expand this to look at all the four knockout combinations in the population, you can see that uh, it's really the three and four gene effects which make you very resistant. But if you further knock out PDR5, it doesn't really matter what your background is, you're very sensitive to the drug. Another way I did it is to make this sort of classic fitness landscape. So here I've just encoded the genotype with these six dots. And uh, if it's colored in black, it means the knockout. So again, the single knockouts have slightly resistant phenotypes, but then if you zoom into the four genes, there's a dramatic effect, and then any PDR5 knockout is just near the bottom there. Um, to communicate my generation of illustrators <laughs> with emojis, so the, the genetic interpretation is that these genes inhibit um, PDR5 in parallel. So if you have all of them present, this, the cell can still grow, but perhaps not very happily. It's only partially redundant, so if you knock out two of them, you can grow a little bit better. But really what you want to do is knock out all four genes to restore growth. And if it's um, PDR5 is absent, then you're dead no matter what. Uh, this is our small scale validation. It's already in progress. Well, it's in progress because we only have N of 1 so far. But uh, what you can see here is that under intermediate concentrations or high concentrations of clonazole, that the four knockout is indeed more resistant than any other combination. Uh, there are two mechanisms which we're exploring, which I don't have time to really explain, but one of them is based on uh, this, like this competitive protein-protein interaction model between all the genes. And another one is based uh, basically on transcriptional feedback between PDR1 and PDR3. So this is the part I'll have to skip. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, we've uh, devised a method to study these uh, conditional complex genetic interactions using engineered populations. We've created a conditional fitness landscape which shows the prevalence of these unexpected multi-gene knockout effects amongst ABC transporters. And we're validating one of these effects and exploring the potential mechanisms. Uh, we want to increase the scope to include uh, more substrates of other transporters. And we want to automate this using robotics. And you know, far down in the future, we want to develop a method that's analogous to this using more uh, recent technologies such as CRISPR and also expanded into other model systems such as uh, human cell lines. And I'd like to thank uh, members of the Roth Lab and Nozomo Yashi at the University of Tokyo. Thank you. Questions for Ali? I have a question. So, this is the your knockouts are engineered. Yeah. Uh, but how does um, that affect the fitness of the cell because um, ha accumulating those mutations in a real population is quite stressful on the, on the fitness of the cell. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I didn't mention this, but one reason we chose the ABC transporters, besides the fact that they're important for drug resistance, is because you can make all 60 knockouts, and if there's no drug in the medium, it actually grows fairly well. Like, there's very little uh, drug independent fitness defects amongst the knockout strains. Did you observe any random mutations in your 
I mean, we didn't sequence for any suppressors or anything like that, so of course they're going to show up at some low frequency. Uh, the thing is, the way we're doing the association between genotype to phenotype, it's statistical. So, in, so basically, even if there's like one strain that's really off, the statistics aren't really going to associate that strain with the phenotype is what we hope. So, yeah, at first it's like a mini sort of GWAS and association, then we go to this um, small scale validation. Okay, please join me in thanking Matthew for coming.